I am so excited for this edition of The Right Stuff. We are going to be talking to New York Times bestselling author Tosca Lee and her newest book that dropped today, Firstborn, which is the sequel to Progeny, coming up next right here on The Right Stuff. You are listening to the best, the only, the only place to be on Tuesday night. That's right. You're listening to The Right Stuff, and you're at the right place at the right time. From England to Canada, from Detroit to the Cocono, we are showcasing Christian authors worldwide, giving you tips, tools, techniques, and resources for you, the writer, to hone and perfect your craft. Tune in every Tuesday at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time right here on WPJC 104.5. And your host, Parker J. Cole. Hi, and welcome to the show. Like I said before our intro, we have Tosca Lee with us on the show today. She's going to be sharing about her newest book, Firstborn, getting us up to date with what's been going on since the last time she was on the show, and so much more. So if you want to call in and weigh in, you certainly can by calling in at 646-668-8485, and then press 1 to be live on air. She'll love to take your questions and your comments, or hit me on social media at Parker on Twitter and then hashtag write stuff with your question or your comment. Just a couple of announcements I want to make for you. My newest book called A Time to Say Goodbye will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. If you want an ARC of that, just simply go to my website, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll get a free ARC of my newest sweet romance called Time to Say Goodbye. And then thank you all for your support of my um, release back in January called The Cure. I've been getting great responses from you all. Thank you so much for your support of that. Now, I will be at the Southern California Christian Writers Conference in La Mirada this year from June 22nd through the 24th, and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you there. I'll be hosting two workshops. Those workshops will be Taboo Subjects in Christian Fiction and then Swearing and Harsh Language in Christian Fiction. I'll be talking about those at that conference. I'm really excited about that. So if you're in the La Mirada area and you want to write you, you're writing, you want to meet agents, editors, publishers, other authors, and kind of get together, this is the conference you do not want to miss. So definitely go online and register for the Southern California Christian Writers Conference. It is going to be a blast. What's really exciting is that a lot of the people that I've had on this show will be at that conference. And so you get to meet some of your favorite authors, some new and upcoming authors, and great, great content. So if you want to go and uh, be around a lot of authors, go to the Southern California Christian Writers Conference this year, June 22nd through the 24th. You don't want to miss it. And then while you're there, hang out. There's some great uh, sites and sightseeing over there that you can enjoy with you and your family. So bring the whole family and enjoy the Southern Christian Writers Conference. Simply Google Southern Christian Writers Conference online and you'll get more information about it. We're going to go ahead and take a quick short break. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. More with Parker and her guest on the Right Stuff Radio Show. We'll be right back. Have you read the latest issue of SORMAG Digital, the award-winning literary magazine for multicultural readers and writers? SORMAG Digital is available quarterly and showcases interviews with the best authors in multicultural literature. SORMAG Digital features craft and business articles for those interested in writing. If you're looking for a good book, check out our book reviews on what's hot in multicultural literature. For writers looking for a new reader to get in front of, SORMAG Digital is the perfect place to introduce your book. We offer advertising spaces that fit your promotional budget. Get your free subscription on SORMAG.com or order a print issue on magcloud.com. If you would like more information about SORMAG Digital, check us out on SORMAG.com or contact us at SORMAG at yahoo.com. SORMAG Digital is the magazine for multicultural readers and writers. Engaging the culture's imagination through speculative fiction, the Untold Podcast produces audio fiction from a Christian worldview. Find us over at untoldpodcast.com, where we partner with authors to tell science fiction, fantasy, supernatural, and horror stories. Find links at untoldpodcast.com to subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, and a variety of other platforms. Each month we produce high-quality audio fiction that's free to download and free to listen. Our submissions are open, and we're always looking to add another great story to over 24 hours of narrative entertainment. Find all of our audio fiction over at www.untoldpodcast.com. 
We're back, and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. and her guests, right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome back to the show. Again, I'm so, so very excited to have you with me on the show today. We'll be talking to New York Times bestselling author Tosca Lee about her newest release, What's Been Going On with Tosca, and so much more. You can call in and weigh in by calling in at 646 668 Eight four eight five, and then press one to be live on air. Or hit me on Twitter at Parker J Cole. Hashtag Write Stuff with your questions and comments. And without further ado, I want to introduce our guest co-host and contributor today, Tasca Lee. Tasca, how you doing today? Doing great, Parker. Thank you for having me back. And I'm so excited to have you back. I always enjoy having you. We had such a great time the other mm-hmm. uh, the other show you were with us. And so love to be able to showcase your newest book, First Born, on the show. And so before mm-hmm. I do that, it's quite possible that someone has never heard of Tosca Lee before. So go ahead and introduce what? us in your own words. <laughs> oh, oh, how do I do that? Uh, I'm a writer. Um, I am a newlywed and also a new mom, instant mom of four. Last year I became a mother instantly when I married a single father of four. Mm. Um, so I'm a woman in the midst of a lot of uh, chaos and stuff happening all the time, <laughs> learning how <laughs> to balance things out and uh, living in a state of continued uh, gratitude every single day to have the people that I love surrounding me and to get to do what I do um, for a living. And Mm -hmm. other than that, I married a farmer, so I'm a farmer's wife now. So a lot has changed because if you knew me before, I've always been a city girl. And um, it's life is different right now. So (laughs) I don't know what else to tell you. Um, Yeah, I've always been kind of a weird girl. So there's that, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) I think all writers have that aspect of the weird. We couldn't create if we didn't have it. I think it's required. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Mm-hmm. I like how you said that uh, you're a farmer's wife now. And I've said this mm-hmm. on the show before. I've had, you're like the second person who's been in agriculture, a like farmer, like a farmer on mm-hmm. the show. And uh, <laughs> I, I always laugh because the most rustic I ever became was when I went on a writer's retreat to a camp and it had running water oh. and light electricity. So that's as rustic as it got. It was a log wow. cabin though. I think that, <laughs> I think that counts, but uh I, wow. I just How was that adjustment? I mean, I know that must fuel your creative juices too, having that asset from a city girl oh, to yeah. a, a farmer's daughter. I mean, farmer's <laughs> wife. How does that uh, help you? Yeah, yeah, it's totally been. Um, it's it's been a big adjustment in many ways. I mean, I'm out in the country, but you know, it's so quiet, and um, you know, I live in a big farmhouse in the the country, and you know, I I literally just had to close my window because there's an owl or something or a dove. I don't know what the bird is. Some bird <laughs> is hooting outside, so I closed my window so I could talk to you. But it's peaceful and everything's green right now. And it's it's great. I love it. And you know, we play football in the yard, and and I I can make big pots of food now. I always overcooked before, but now I can make big pots of food, and there's enough people to eat it. So life is good. Life I is find happy. that I, I just couldn't imagine. <laughs> I just couldn't imagine because. <laughs> When I think of uh, farming, I just think of I that's not my element, you know. But I guess if you, you know, if you really put yourself to it, you can find that you are actually more suited to it than you thought you were. Is that something you kind of experience as you try to transition from that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it's really it's not like I'm the one having to do the farming or I'm the one, you know, for me, it's, it's basically a location change and the, you know, the nearest grocery store and Pilates and all that stuff is a lot farther away. But Mm -hmm. other than that, you know, the biggest adjustment is, is becoming a mom and, Mm -hmm. you know, I I have no idea what I'm doing, but they're training (laughs) me really well. So (laughs) (laughs) So I have no idea what I'm doing. On the job and constant. So, and I love it. You know, it's, it's fun. Every single day is an adventure. So, but I've been tired a lot. I have to mm-hmm. say, um, becoming an instant mom of four, um, I I go to bed a lot earlier than I used to. Oh, so I would think so with all that. It's uh, uh, with interesting. 
me, she being a mom, you know, you go from being a mom to, I mean, for me single and by yourself to being a mom. And I think that's a huge adjustment, but I think that's cool. And I think that I, I think the Lord blessed you with the temperament to handle it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, oh. uh, you know, well, thank you. And, you know, I, I have been blessed and I also, I'm blessed with a, a, a wonderful, nurturing, very graceful soul for a husband. And it's just, um, I can't, yeah, I, I couldn't have asked for a better partner in life. So oh, that's beautiful. beautiful. I love yeah. hearing about that. I love that. Yeah, I remember you told us you. on the show last time we were uh, highlighting progeny and you told us on the show, you said, well, I'm, I'm getting married. I remember thinking, Oh my gosh, you're getting married. You yep. know? And now you're here, you know, and infiltrating to this life. You know, there are, let me ask you a question. It's kind of off balance. But I would love to get your opinion on this. You know, there are a lot of women who may be single waiting for God to send them that husband, whether they're single, they've never been married, or they've been married and separated or married and divorced. You know, what kind of encouragement you give those women that they're the man that God has for them, that kind, gentle hearted man that God has for them, or that man with a kind, gentle hearted woman that God has for them? What kind of encouragement can you give them? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it's it's hard because you know I I was married before and it was right. not the best situation and and I remember thinking you know very discouraging thoughts and you know so this happened for me at a time in my life when I had really kind of given up in a way and I guess the the thing that I would say is even if you feel like you've gotten to the point where you've given up or you're discouraged God hasn't given up on you and God still has a plan. And, you know, I call God the ultimate storyteller, you know, the author mm -hmm. of plot twists in life yeah. that you never see coming. And, mm -hmm. you know, so have faith that there's a plot tw twist down the road, you know, ahead for you. I think I just mixed two metaphors, but there's a plot twist in another chapter. <laughs> there you go for you. I like that. It is a plot twist because sometimes it usually it happens when you least suspect it. And sometimes you're at your lowest point. I know, I know, I know a young lady who's been single for quite some time, and it depresses her to the point she's like, mm -hmm. "How come God won't send me, you know, my my miracle, my Boaz, or whatever?" And I said, mm -hmm. uh, "I didn't say anything actually because I'm married, and so um, I don't want to mm -hmm. be arrogant in trying to advise her to just wait. I don't want to be arrogant, you know what I mean? Talk about mm -hmm. how you can get arrogant and stuff like that. But I appreciate you saying that because there could be someone listening out there like, you know." When will my turn come? You know, when will my mm -hmm. turn be to walk down the aisle or jump the broom or whatever um, wedding tradition mm -hmm. that we have? I know for my, myself, I jumped the broom. Me and my husband jumped the broom when we got married mm -hmm. in the uh, church, you know. And then this month yep. is my 10-year anniversary. We've been married for 10 years. Well, happy um, anniversary. Oh, thank you. I'm excited. I'm surprised it's been that long. <laughs> I'm so surprised it's been that long. <laughs> it's so flies. It, it just goes by so quickly. And the other day, he's going to kill me if he hears this, but the other day I was looking at him and I was staring at him. I looked, I said, you're getting gray hair, you know? Oh, <laughs> so no. his hair is his uh, vanity. It's his one vanity that he has. He's like, no, I'm not. I said, okay. If it'll make no. you feel better. <laughs> it's just yeah, right, right I have up a hair dresser hair. who calls. I have a hairdresser who calls the gray ones um, sparkles. Mm -hmm. So he, he like has sparkles. Twilight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah, it. maybe not. <laughs> but it's just a little bling on your head. It's not a gray hair. It's just a sparkle. So. Oh, yeah. That's what it is. I'll see that I'll, yeah. I'll roll with her next time. <laughs> so, you know, but I'm really excited to be talking about your, your newest book. I'm so excited about that. So but I want people to kind of, you know, go into the world of firstborn and progeny. Let's go ahead and open mm. up the bandwidth here of what's going on in your series with Progeny and now your newest book, Firstborn. Mm, okay. Well, this is a duology. So it all starts in the first book, which is the progeny. And at the beginning of the book, um, there's a character. Her name is Emily. And she is going into a center for a procedure. And she's having the the last two years of her memory erased. And we don't know why. We don't know where the center is. We don't know, you know, what exactly is happening. And then the story starts, and she is recovering from this procedure in Maine and starting over. And she, uh, she has a caretaker who's getting ready to leave and says, you know, this letter is for you as she leaves. And this letter was written by Emily to herself. And hmm. it basically says, 
Don't ask about the last two years. Don't try to remember. Don't go digging. Your life depends on it, and other lives depend on it. And then it says, P.S., uh, your real name isn't Emily. Um, you died in a car accident. You paid extra for that. So she realizes that she's, she hasn't come just to start over. She has really come to Maine to, to hide. And she's living in a very remote part of Maine. And within, within a month of her being there, she's, um, she's basically, you know, found. And she goes on the run and she finds out that she is a descendant of this infamous um, historical serial killer named Elizabeth Batheroy, that she's from a long um, line of descendants with some interesting kind of slight supernatural powers, and that they're mm. being systematically hunted by a secret society that's out to eradicate all of them. So she goes on the run to Europe, and it's basically a um, run-for-your-life um, adventure that happens over the course of two um, the two books. And and I'm so glad, let me just say, I'm so glad that Firstborn is out today because I've mm-hmm. kind of been in hiding because <laughs> th- the first book did end on a cliffhanger and I really meant for the second book to come out sooner and everything was all set up for that. And then because of Forces Beyond My Control, it was delayed. And so I've had readers waiting for the second book for quite a while, which takes up exactly where the progeny leaves off. So now I'm officially out of hiding. So that's the farm. Yes. You do have to hide when your readers are trying to break. If they can, if they knew where you live, they would break down your door. Like, are that's you kidding right. me, Pastor? <laughs> yeah. And it's are like, yeah, kidding? I'm so sorry that I ended it on a cliffhanger, but not really because I really enjoyed doing it. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad this book is out. I, I like, you know, I think that's one of, that's a tactic that a lot of writers use when they're writing, you know, more than one within a series or with a, a sequel like that. And you look on, mm-hmm. in on a cliffhanger, but sometimes the readers are like, no, you can't yes, do this. That's thing, right. Especially when it's really good. And I, I love that type of thing. Well, how was the genesis of Virginia and, and now first one? How did that come to be? Were you walking down the street one day and saw a leaf and said, <laughs> aha, you know, how did that idea come about? <laughs> Um, you know, it was a, a fan who wrote to me and said, maybe you should do something about Elizabeth Bathroy. And she's a fascinating character. I had heard of her before. Um, she's known, you know, in legend as the Bled Countess because she she is supposedly, you know, killed like some 600 young girls or something like that. I mean, she oh. is on a, a par with Vlad Tepes, who became, you know, Dracula in myth and legend and stuff. But um, you know, his, historically speaking, you know, she's she's fascinating because despite all this legend about her, she was known as a doting mother and she gave money to the church and she was um, educated and fluent in four languages. And this doesn't seem like the kind of person that would, you know, do these things that, that history and legend say about her. So um, I found that fascinating and, and I thought that it would be uh, fun to to do some kind of a modern day thriller, but um, but use her as kind of the the backdrop, I guess, the the mythology, you know, behind the story. So um, that's a long way of saying that it was a reader who um, who suggested it, and I put it in my little idea file, and there it was. So I like how you mentioned how the reader. Uh, help give you that idea because let you know that readers are so involved in the author's life oh, which is yeah. why I think it's mm. so important to connect with our readers they're so involved with that and you know Elizabeth uh, you said Bledsoe right I, I remember her I couldn't remember her name but she was the one she killed she had her her and her servants supposedly killed all these women and she bathed in their blood mm-hmm. or something so yep she, supposedly she bathed in their blood and all this yeah yeah, and and this too, and so uh, and then I guess to counteract that, she just gave to the church, kind of like, yeah, I killed this girl yesterday, so I'll you know I'll do that. <laughs> and so uh, I actually think her 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 story, like that, whether it's true or not, it kind of reflects the human condition, you know, it lets us know that you know the Bible says you know the uh, the the heart is um, vain, wicked, and deceitfully wicked, vain. Who can know it? You know that it can do these horrible mm-hmm. things. You know, and so I like how mm-hmm. you use that that thing there. It's like, okay, if she indeed 
if she indeed killed these women and then she's trying to make up for it by doing good works, it's like it doesn't balance out in anyone's book. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> stop killing mm-hmm. women. <laughs> then it'll, then it'll balance out. So, mm-hmm. um, so you work on this. You work on this idea. Now, how long does it take you to generally write a book? Generally, I know sometimes you can't control, like you said, forces mm-hmm. behind your circumstances, you know, but generally right. speaking, how does it take for you to write a book? You know, it, it really depends. I mean, for a book like Iscariot, which was my my novel about Judas, um, and, you know, my other historical fiction like that, they can take me a while. That one took me three years. This mm-hmm. one, though, because it takes place um, more current day and the history is just kind of the backdrop of the story, um, you know, I think I did this one in a few months. And then mm-hmm. the sequel was faster than that because, you know, by then I kind of knew, you know, what was going to happen and the characters were established. And so that, you know, the second book is much easier. So, you know, a few months. A few months. Well, that, that, that's good because I know there are authors out there now who say, well, this book has taken so long to write and mm-hmm. it's taken me forever. I know my very first book, which is my first first book ever, which was a horror novel called Dark Cherub, and it's available for those of you who want to look at it. Uh, uh, that took me 10 years. It took me 10 years to write. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. it took me 10 years because it originally didn't start off the way I had it. And then I kept rewriting and writing it and rewriting and writing it. And then when I was let go at my job back in 2010, when I was let go, um, I looked at it and I said, I'm sick of seeing you on computer and I had the old fashioned computer, no flat screen, you know. So I'm, mm. I uh and I remember even having it on a, a three and a half floppy disk. Some of those remember those oh, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> those floppy disks and I, I remember, remember I, I had rolled on here. Oh yeah. And then the the five and a quarter disk, the floppy ones with a big mm-hmm. giant hole you put a donut through. Um right. I remember having those those two and I remember saying, you know what, this is gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Mm-hmm. It happened. I remember crying. I just totally bust out crying. Like, I'm playing an author. Mm-hmm. And then all that kind of stuff. So I always like to ask those kind of questions, Tosca, because I want our listeners out there to know that um, the most experienced of us still take time to write. Even though it may be an idea oh, yeah. you may start 10 years ago, we still have, you still have to take that time out to write. We're going to go ahead and take a quick short break. When we come back, more with Tosca Lee, her newest book, Firstborn, and your questions and comments. Call in at 646 646- Six six eight eight four eight five, and then press one to be live on air. Or hit me on Twitter at Parker J. Cole. Hashtag write stuff with your questions and comments. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. More with Parker and her guests on the Write Stuff Radio Show. We'll be right back. Question: If you write a book, everybody will rush out to buy it. Obvious answer: No. If you were a celebrity, or if you had a huge marketing budget, then maybe you can get a lot of exposure for your book. Another solution would be to check out JoeyTweets.com. JoeyTweets.com is a promotion and marketing service with access to over one-third of a million followers on Twitter. JoeyTweets.com has three packages available to fit any budget. That's J-O-E-Y-T-W-E-E-T-S.com. JoeyTweets.com. Get some serious exposure for your books. God gives humans the gift of making amazing stories to glorify Him. At speculativefaith.com, our ministry is to help fans explore fantasy, science fiction, supernatural stories, and beyond from an intentional and biblical Christian perspective. We share daily articles and have extensive archives tackling hot topics like end times beliefs, the art of writing, creative excellence in the Christian subcultures, discernment, sex, magic, Harry Potter, and space aliens and the Bible. If you are a parent or anyone else with a discriminating palate, our reviewers explore fantastical novels, movies, television, and games in light of God's beauty, goodness, and truth. Want to find Christian stories? The SpecFaith Library lists every fantastical novel we can find from a Christian author. It's all part of our mission to discern, engage, and enjoy fantastical human creativity in honor of our Creator, Jesus Christ. SpeculativeFaith.com Exploring fantastical stories for God's glory. We're back, and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. and her guest, right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome back. So glad you are here. We are having a wonderful conversation with my guest co-host and contributor today, New York Times best-selling author Tosca Lee. Her newest book, Firstborn, is out. For those of you who read Prodigy and she left you hanging, she will not leave you hanging anymore. Go ahead and get a 
copy of First Born Today. It's available wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, wherever books are sold, go ahead and get a copy of First Born Today. You're going to finally find out what happens next. And Tosca, again, thank you so much for being with me as we continue to discuss, you know, all of the things that you are writing about and all the things that you're doing. So the one question I want to ask you is how have things changed for you as, you know, this, how, many, how many books have you written so far? Um, this is how many uh, books have been? Published. I've had nine published, and then I've got my first novel still in my basement and then I've got <laughs> one that was almost done and I worked on it for nine years and it never got finished. So, you know, I'd say I've got nine published, but I've got 10 and three quarters done. <laughs> so That's we've wrong all got with our that. little novel skeletons in the basement, you know? Oh yeah. I, uh, it's funny you mentioned that because I found a fantasy story I have wrote probably like when I was 20, 21 and I had 150 pages, 150 pages. And I actually remember mm -hmm. writing this story. I remember sitting on the floor in my bedroom when I was with my mom and my dad. And I had Finding Nemo on the computer or on the TV. I can't remember which one. And I would just mm -hmm. rewind the movie. I could watch things over and over and over again. So I rewind the movie. I remember I rewound the movie five times. And I was looking at mm -hmm. that as I wrote this story. And I was like, what happened to all that time I had? <laughs> I had so much time. Right. To write back then, but then I wasn't married and have a house and have a job, you know, all that kind of, kind of stuff too. That could be it. Right. And so my question to you is, how have things changed for you from your first book pu being published to your latest book being published? And what about change your writing style, your writing thoughts, um, um, things like that? How have things changed? Have, have, do you feel like your writing's matured over time? What are some of your mm -hmm. things have changed? You know, two things come to mind right away. One is in my approach to writing my novels, I used to overwrite my books a lot. And by overwrite, <laughs> I mean by 60 to 100,000 words, like too much. And then I'd go through and I'd call all that out. Mm -hmm. And so there's that. And I, I don't really do that anymore. I, I still like to lean down the manuscript as I get, you know, go through the editing process, but there's far less to trim out now. Um, and I think another part um, that's changed for me is I've, I've really tried to streamline um, my language a little bit more. I, I love using, you know, beautiful words and things like that, but, you know, lately, you know, we morph as artists, you know, and we change in our styles and approaches to things. And these days, especially with writing thrillers, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm much more interested in keeping things very simple and straightforward. So okay. those are probably two of the biggest, biggest things. So That's fascinating. Yeah. That's fascinating, Tosca, because, um, mind you, I'm not, I'm not on your level, obviously, but I was reading some of my older stuff and I was looking at my writing and I was like, oh, my gosh, I think I've changed over time, you know. And I know other authors mm -hmm. out there, the more you keep writing, the more you keep getting better at it. And what's going to happen, you'll be yeah. able to look at the, the older stuff. You go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I said it like that. Or, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I used that word. Or this was so yeah. wrong and all these other kind of things. But that's why you have to keep writing. You have to keep writing. So we do have a caller yeah. calling. And we have a caller calling from Detroit. Mm. Caller, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine, and thank you for allowing me to be on your show. I'd like to speak to your guest, Miss Lee, is it? Yes, yes. Ask Lee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Miss Lee, hi. My name is Jenny hi. White, and I'm a children's book author. And I find I'm having the most difficult time trying to find the time to finish my book. I don't know mm. if you already spoke about this. How do you find time to write? What do you mm -hmm. have to do? Mm. Well, I mean, it's like finding, first of all, hi, Jenny. It's Jenny, right? Hi, and yes. Okay, hi. Um, I think it's just like anything. I mean, if it's something that's important to you, then you you have to make the time, whether that means getting up a little earlier or staying up a little later at night or skipping another activity. 
And I know that, you know, this has really been an issue for me since becoming an insta mom last year. And, you know, it's like, I don't know where my time went now, but um, I, I guess that's one of the lucky things about, you know, later on in your career, you get deadlines, which feel kind of like a curse when it happens, but they are actually very helpful. So maybe you need to set some deadlines for yourself or find somebody that can be an accountability partner to you. Um, but I think yeah, it maybe just comes that's down what to I figuring. Because I, yeah. when, I I, when I set deadlines for myself, I just skip right over them. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, I, I see now why writers, authors have to go out to the forest, to the cabin, to be alone, <laughs> to write, you yeah. know, because there's so much stuff coming at you. Of course. And, it's just, and, yeah, and my, social my media book is and not, all this other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And my big book yep. is, my books are not even, I mean, they're like 23, 24, 25 pages. So, mm-hmm. you know, that shouldn't take me no more than even one whole day I should be able to get through a book. But then I well, have here's other a thought things coming you. at me. Here's okay. what, what you do. You treat yourself to a day or even a overnight retreat somewhere. So whether it's at a hotel or whether it's at a friend's house or somewhere, you know, or borrow, you know, a, a, a friend's spare room or something, but you take yourself on a, a little retreat and tell yourself that you're going to work on this while you're there. And if you can be alone while you're doing it, that's that's better than, you know, staying at a friend's house or something because you'll actually not be tempted to, you know, visit the whole time. Um, but that's what I have to do sometimes is go kind of hole up somewhere um, for a few days to just really get some work done without distraction. Right. Well, that's good to know. I just – maybe to the library. I find that when I was in college, there you even go. if I was home alone – at the house, you know, I got the television, I got the telephone, I got the refrigerator. The I mean, <laughs> yeah, I got mm-hmm. it all. So I would physically have to remove myself from that environment. So, yeah, I see what you're saying. Maybe well, the library I can do is that. great. Yeah. The library yeah. is wonderful. They've got little conference yeah. rooms sometimes that you can lock right. yourself Absolutely. in, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's what I'll have to do. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for calling in. No problem. Thank you so much, Jenny, for calling in. That was Jenny from Detroit. And, you know, Tosca, Jenny actually highlights a problem a lot of authors complain about is time management. And so I know yeah. recently for myself, I actually did that. I didn't tell anybody but my husband because he had to know, you know, but I recently just locked myself in a hotel room this past mm-hmm. weekend and just wrote the entire time. I only came out to go to mm-hmm. church and then I came back and was back in the hotel room, just writing, writing. And that's, I would take breaks, you know, because your mind just explodes with so much information. And then, um, cause you need that break as you're trying to write. And so I like how you said, yeah. you know, take yourself out that busy environment, you know, and like Jenny, yeah. Jenny uh, quipped how she said that you got to go into the forest away from people, you know, where you see maybe, you know, Gandalf standing around there protecting you from all, all the busyness uh, <laughs> that's going on, you know what I mean? Because you just want that time. And and I think she, and she brought something too that I want you to uh, expand on, Tosca. She said, you know, I'm a children's book author and my books could be 25 pages top. And it just lets mm-hmm. you know just how no matter what you're writing, it can be a task. You know, can you go ahead and expand mm-hmm. on that? Well, say that last part. I didn't, the last no, part that the fact that even though she says she's a children's book author, twenty five pages could be her book. That writing is a task. Mhm. Well, you know, it it is something that if you you just have to commit yourself to. And you know, I I think one of the hardest things about making time to write is this idea of of. Um, It sounds like a dirty word, but of procrastination, you know, in a way, because we find other things that we we do. Well, we have to do the laundry. Well, we have to cook dinner. Well, we have to feed our kids. Well, we have to, of course, we have to do all those things. But in the meantime, you know, it's, it's easy to avoid the project at hand. And I think sometimes we we enable ourselves to do that because mm-hmm. when we're not in there getting messy doing it, you know, it's it's still perfect in our minds. But when you sit down to write and it starts to get messy, 
you know, you realize, gosh, this is not coming out as beautifully or as perfect as I thought it would. And you have to deal with the mess. And so I think sometimes, you know, not having time is, is a way for us to allow that project to be shiny and perfect still while it's, you know, in our imagination, you know, and not have to deal with the big mess of getting in there and, and getting our hands dirty. But mm. does that make sense? I think it does because sometimes, especially like, you know, if I set my own deadline, you know, I can, I set it, I can set it, reset it again. You know, I think that's mm-hmm. kind of like um, where some people where uh, Jenny was coming from our call or where she was coming from. And like how she mm-hmm. said that, cause I can set my own deadline. So, okay, I'm going to get done with this. I'm only responsible for myself. So I really like you yeah. having an accountability partner. And I also think too, and talk that you can relate. I don't know if you can relate to this or not. I know some authors, they crank out the book so quickly and you're looking like, well, how are they able to do that? How come I can't do that? But, and this is just, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but do you think maybe if an author's livelihood is dependent on their writing, you know, like this is what they do to make money, Mm -hmm. this is how they pay their bills, you know, do you think that, uh, uh, that adds to that fuel to get it done? Do you think maybe if you don't write, if you write for enjoyment and if you don't write for a living, you know. If it's a job, you know, I, I, I like to eat. So <laughs> this is my full-time job. So I've, I've got to make those deadlines. So, you know, before I had that, it was, it was hard to make myself sit down and write. And it was hard to do that. And in between, I had other jobs and I had other responsibilities and things, you know. So um, it does change when you're doing it as a livelihood. So for sure, it makes a yeah, difference. Yeah, I think... I think that does make a difference too. And um, mm-hmm. that, mind you, I'm not saying that people shouldn't write for enjoyment. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just saying for some of us, we write because we enjoy writing. And for other of us, this is how we make money. This is how I live. I know there's one story, I don't know if you ever saw it, where this couple was about to lose their house. They were going to lose their house. They had no job. They were going to lose their house. They end up writing, I think, within... I don't know, some sick number, like six weeks. They wrote like a book or a couple of books in six weeks, something like that. And it became mm-hmm. best selling. And then they actually, mm-hmm. because it became best selling, they were able to pay and stave off the foreclosure on their home. And then they just started cranking wow. them out. They just started cranking them out. And yep. I like those kind of stories, you know. And then you have some authors who say, well, I haven't sold a book in four months and all, <laughs> and all this other kind of stuff. You just keep pushing that <laughs> well, out. Well, you know, my <laughs> first book <laughs> took six years to sell. So... Mm-hmm. Um, and I did write that, that manuscript that would become Demon a Memoir, my first novel. I did write mm-hmm. it in six weeks, but then it took six years. So, you know, and in between, I was having a hard time finding the motivation to continue writing, you know, another one or the next one because everything was kind of in limbo. So I, I understand, um, you know, how hard it can be to, to find mm-hmm. that time, to make that time, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then it does change when you start doing it on a regular basis, you know, or, or as a job. So, yeah, totally, totally feel that one too. Now I got to let our listeners know, because my, I was so excited to get this from Tosca. Tosca mm-hmm. was, uh, recently endorsed my book, The Cure. And I hurried up and splatted it on the cover of the book because I was so yes. <laughs> excited to get an endorsement from Tosca Lee. I this is a New York Times bestselling author, and she endorsed mm-hmm. my book. And I got to tell you, and please uh, expand on this for me, too, uh, Tosca. I know I t- technically, you know, we have to validate our own, uh, our own talent. You know, we can't say I need someone to validate my talent for me. We have to validate our own talent. I know mm-hmm. sometimes what stops writers from finishing that book is their own self-doubt in themselves, you know. But I got to oh, tell yeah, you, for sure. when I got that endorsement, I feel like, oh, my gosh, if she <laughs> likes it, <laughs> If she mm-hmm. likes it, maybe I'm better than I give myself credit for it. You know what I mean? And so uh, can you kind of speak to, you know, just having the belief in yourself that you can write and how that can really aid the writer in continuing to finish their book? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that, you know, having confidence in pushing away fear while you're writing, I mean, that is one of the ongoing battles, I think, for every single writer, or at least it is it is for most of the writers I know, and it is for me. And I think, you know, when you sit down to write, you know, there's a reason that I say my number one rule of writing is to write like no one will ever read this. Well, why would I say that? Because Mm. when you write, like you're writing secret stuff in your closet, 
you're not mm-hmm. afraid. And you can be mm-hmm. completely authentic and honest and gritty or whatever. You know, you're not thinking about what your parents or pastor or neighbors or anybody's going to, you know, think about it. If you think about that while you're writing, I mean, it's just going to constipate you basically. So, mm-hmm. um, so I think, you know, pushing, finding ways to, you know, push aside fear um, is one of the most important ways that we hold on to that confidence while we're writing and say, okay, let me stretch out my 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 arms in this world and you know see what I can do in here and have fun. That's the right? most important part is having fun when you write. I know yeah. when you create your world, I know Hava, oh my God, I just love Hava. Okay. You know, that book just really mm. oh, I love that book, Hafka, you know. And no, uh, just the you. imagery and the uh, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful book. And, you know, I know other authors are like, I can't write like You know, the first thing they say is, I can't do that. And it's like, you're telling us, you know, don't let those negative thoughts constipate. I love that phrase. I mean, use it forever now, because (laughs) we all have been in a situation where we've been in that situation before. Not to get bald or anything, but... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we all have to kind of, it's like swimming in your own lane, basically. I mean, you can't sit there and look around at what everybody else is doing. You can't be worried about all the people that are watching you or looking. You just have to do your thing. And when I think about, you know, remember back to, you know, when we're kids and we, we would play, we'd make up things, we'd make up songs, we'd, you know, whatever. And we weren't self-conscious about this stuff. We, you mm-hmm. know, we were, we were just having a great time and, and, you know, why shouldn't we approach story writing with that same kind of joy and lack of self-consciousness, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think, I you, think. <laughs> you know, you brought up something that I'm going to talk about on the other side of the break, and I'll just give you a hint of it. One of the things you brought up was the fact that, especially for Christian authors or for authors who write Christian fiction, depending on how you look at it, there is that awareness that, oh, my gosh, this may be too whatever – for the Christian market. And I always think that writing is a, I mean, just like any ministry, like I see myself, I see my right as a ministry. Some authors don't see it that way. Like I said, it's, it's their livelihood. It's how they money. I see them as a hobby. It's what I enjoy doing. But, you know, you brought something up that I think we'll to expand on, on the other side of the break about, you know, stop worrying about what other people are going to think about this. You know, now my mm-hmm. think you have to be vulgar. I'm not saying that, you know, but, you know, you got to kind of come out of the 12 about my right and so that's why I said about having that validation yourself and so we're going to talk about that on the other side of break with my guest host Pasca Lee she is letting us know that her newest book Firstborn part two of the progeny is out today now some of you who read it you were left hanging and hanging on a mighty cliff for her book progeny you don't have to hang any longer Go ahead and get a copy of Firstborn Today, available now, wherever books are sold. If you want to call in and weigh in, you certainly can by calling in at 646-668-8485, and then press 1 to be live on air, or hit me on Twitter at Parker J. Co. hashtag write stuff with your questions and comments. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. More with Parker and her guests on the Right Stuff Radio Show. We'll be right back. Are you a reader looking for more compelling Christian fiction? Maybe something a little more edgy or a bit more real? Are you tired of most Christian fiction shying away from the truth and settling for a rose-tinted view of the world and its issues? Or are you an author who has a compelling story to tell, but you're afraid it doesn't jive with today's brand of Christian or secular fiction? Are you tired of Christian publishers telling you that your content is too edgy? Or maybe you've tried submitting your content under the radar to secular publishers, only to be told your themes are a bit too religious. We invite you to take a look at the Crossover Alliance. We are an online publishing company that specializes in edgy Christian speculative fiction. Speculative fiction with Christian themes and real-world content. Our company is formed from authors and readers just like you who are breaking into the mainstream and Christian markets with this compelling genre. Head over to the www.thecrossoveralliance.com for all the details on who we are, what we do, and what we accept. Right now, if you sign up for our email newsletter, you'll receive a free digital copy of our first short story anthology. Check us out today and help us spread the word about the Crossover Alliance, where light shines brighter in the darkness. 
Arthurs, are you looking for a new way to get your book in the hands of new audience, of targeted buyers? Then a virtual book tour is for you. Right now, virtual book tours is an excellent opportunity for you to introduce your book and who you are as an author. Launching your book is very important. A virtual book tour will connect you with readers. We at WNL, we specialize in book tours, book blasts, radio tours, cover reveals, and Facebook chat. Promoting and marketing your book is what we do. Online publicity, the exposure and the publicity is what you need. Let us help you reach new readers and a new audience. We take care of everything so you don't have to. We set up the tour for you. We connect you with bloggers to advertise your book by way of interviews, guest posts, and reviews. If you are an author of a newly published book, have an upcoming release, or just want to give a previously published book new life, a virtual book tour is your answer. Check our tours out at www.wnlbooktours.com. Visit me on Facebook. I am the owner, Paulette Harper. We're back, and you're hanging out with the queen of Tuesday night, Parker J. and her guests, right here on The Right Stuff. Welcome back to the show. We are just having a phenomenal time with my guest co-host and contributor today, Tosca Lee. She is telling us about her newest book, Firstborn. It has dropped today, May 2nd. Write this day down in history that you have Firstborn available to you. For those of you who have been hanging on, you know what happens next. Firstborn is out. Get a copy of that on Amazon.com or wherever books are sold. And Tosca, you've been just enlightening us about your books, about writer life, about your own family, just how things have changed. It's been wonderful having you on the show. And one, oh, thing, thank that we, you. one thing that we mentioned before the break was the fact that, you know, you can't worry about what other people are going to think about your mm-hmm. books. And that's especially important when it comes to Christian fiction in general, because so many people have certain ideas about what Christian fiction is. You know, some people want to be extremely wholesome. It should have all purity, um, a good morals, everything you possibly think of. And then you have those of us who like it a little bit edgier, a little bit more realistic, and those of us who don't care what you put in it, as long as you have a gospel message with it. And so go ahead and speak to that about not worrying, especially in the Christian fiction industry in particular. Mm-hmm. Especially in that. You know, um, that's why I said, you know, when you're writing, you can't you can't be thinking to yourself, you know, what are my my church friends or my pastor, or, you know, other people in the community going to be thinking about this? Because whatever the story it is that you have to tell, you need to tell that story. How you mm. tell it depends on you and depends on, you know, kind of what your, you know, A, what market you want to sell it in. If you want to sell it in the Christian market, there are certain things you, you know, need to um, address or, you know, abide by. Um, but, you know, it's, there, it's such a span because as you said, you know, you've got your, your really, really, you know, clean, um, you know, faith messages all over, you know, mm-hmm. books, you've got other books that, as you said, are more edgy, um, mm-hmm. you know, so I think it really just depends on the person. And, you know, I think it also I think we have to realize, too, that not every book is for every person. And that is so important to remember, especially as you're publishing books, because it's really easy to have someone come along, give you a negative review because they didn't like it or because of something in it or whatever, and to just be crushed by that. And you, you cannot be crushed by, you know, things like that and do this job. So... Um, not every book is for every person. And so who mm-hmm. is your ideal audience? Who are you writing the stories for? And write for those people. I love how you said that because some people will let that negative review from someone who may not particularly be interested in the type of work writing that you write. You know, you can't let that stop mm-hmm. you. I remember the first time <laughs> when my first book mm-hmm. came out and this guy gave me a negative review. I mean, it was a no and I remember one is a typewriter, which is for some of you who don't know what typewriter is. I had a typewriter. And I wanted to throw it out the window. I typed on the typewriter. Then I went to a word processor. And then when I had a computer, ugh. And I wanted to throw it out the window. And I didn't want to write again. I thought I was out for four days, Mountain Dew, marshmallows, all over the place, you know. Mm-hmm. And then now when I get 
a, a critical or a negative review, I kind of look to see what can I garner from that review? What kind of feedback can I garner from that review? Are the people right. saying the same thing? They're saying, you know, oh, this, this story dragged on or this story had too many, uh, a lack of transition from one scene to the other. That's reviews you can use. You know, those are, that seems to help mm-hmm. you become a better author. You know, but they're just saying, well, I didn't particularly care for this book. It's not my genre. Then that's subjective. I know for myself, and you, I know for yourself too, Tasca. You've read books that you didn't like. You know, you go, I just oh, can't sure. feel it. I don't get yeah. with, the, with the hoopla. You know, and so that's really good for, me for those authors out there to know. Now, some of you mm-hmm. want to meet Tasca. I know you want to meet her, and there's a way you can meet her coming up very soon. So, <laughs> to tell them how they can meet you and whether or not you'll be in quote unquote costume or not oh in costume i am so mm-hmm. bad at costumes i that's <laughs> like my creativity train stops there oh like I, I have friends who are brilliant at costumes and stuff and i'm i am stupid i do not have the costume <laughs> gene so i doubt i'll be in costume but i will be at so Cal, um the southern california uh writers conference and that is happening june 22nd to 24th and it's at Biola University, and so that'll be um, it'll be a good time. So if you're in the area, come on out. I'm teaching on characterization. I think it's on characterization. I'm teaching on something. Um, mm-hmm. It will be fun. My classes are pens out, um, wor- writing, you know, working workshops. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, come out. It'll be super fun. And uh, beyond that, um, I'll also be at Blue Ridge Christian Writers later this month and so that's in Asheville North Carolina so that's going to be fun too so yeah are you doing costume I I want to do costume so bad but I may come in as a beautiful woman (laughs) so I'm just joking (laughs) I may come in um, I love it you know I just come in just as me but I really want to do Maleficent because when I saw Angelina Jolie do Maleficent I really enjoyed her performance in that movie I enjoyed how she portrayed my character that I grew up with, I just, I really loved it. So I want to be Maleficent, but I may come as Parker, so that's okay. <laughs> I may cool, come as a know. farmer's wife myself. Yeah. So. <laughs> Are you going to have a straw hat, like the old-fashioned straw hat with a bucket? <laughs> Or I might just come as a really tired writer. (laughs) (laughs) Those costumes are great, too, you know? Yeah. Because you look like yourself. Now, were you going to the Realm Makers, too? Were you going to Realm Makers? Not this year. I I tend Mm -hmm. to get there about every other year. So I was there last year. So. Mm But Rail Makers is going to be spectacular. Uh, a lot of friends um, that are going to be there. Ted's going to be there. Uh, mm-hmm. I think Bob Laparulo is going to be there. Kevin Kaiser. So it's going to be pretty awesome. A lot of big names. Yeah, a lot of big names yeah. in the uh, spec fiction industry are going to be there. And I've I've been trying to get there for a couple of years. I'm honest to goodness, I was trying to get there. And literally, I had a, another conference last year, and then I have a SoCal conference this year. And I'm like, they're like, are you coming, Parker? I'm like, I want to be there, you know, but I got to pick and choose right now <laughs> what I can do. So for those of you who yeah. are familiar with round makers, if you like spec with the fiction, if you are a doctor who Star Trek like me, Star Wars, if you like your space aliens, alien gods, um, sci-fi, fantasy, steampunk, you do not want to miss round makers. You definitely want to go to round makers. Right. So go ahead. You, you, know, you will find your people. Sister. Yes, you will find your yep. kind. You will find the people who get it. You know, you like your fairies, yep. you like your elves, they're yep. going to be there. And it's under the bridge of Christian spec fiction or just spec fiction in general, not even just Christian, but if you like spec fiction in general, you will find your kind, your tribe, <laughs> you'll find them, your clan even, you'll find them. There. And so for those of you, um, I support Christian spec fiction authors on this show all the time. And so you definitely want to go ahead and go to Realm Makers too. Um, and I'm glad that Tosca. Uh, you know, we'll probably see each other next year when they have the next year. It'll be so fun to get out there. I know we'll yep. see each other at SoCal. We'll see each other at SoCal, but looking forward to the seeing you. And I know for those of you who want to see Tasca, go ahead and register for the SoCal Christian Writers Conference. It's the first of its kind, isn't it, Tasca? Isn't it like the first? I think this um, is the first year. Yeah. Yeah. This is, and you yep. definitely want to get yeah. in the ground up. Yeah. You definitely want to get yeah. on the ground it's up because be it's going to be so much stuff. It's going to be it's going to be totally totally fun. Now, Tasca, do you know we have five minutes left? I mean, it goes so quick every that, time we that on the show. That always happens. Yeah. You know, we have such a great yeah, time. I, You're like, oh so gosh. Fast. 
Oh, yeah. Yep. So I want people to find you online. So go ahead, tell us where we can find you online. Oh, well, the the easiest way is to go to my website, and that is Tosca Lee. So it's T-O-S-C-A-L-E-E dot com. And then all my social media is on there. My blog's on there. Everything about my books is on there. Um, I'm easy to find. I'm on social media under the same name, Tosca Lee, pretty much on all of them. So now I can use it to spy on my kids. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find me on Snapchat as Tosca Lee and on Instagram and all those things. So, And I have to ask my kids how to work some of this stuff. It's so embarrassing. Oh, <laughs> it's funny how um, – <laughs> They had a uh, when this stuff started to come really rampant. There was a newspaper mm-hmm. uh, clip. They show a little baby typing at the keyboard, and they show all the adults yep. around the baby. And it's like, don't tell your mom we took you out of preschool for this. <laughs> so that's kind of like what had to do with. it. <laughs> yep. I love it. It just shows that our technology is getting more and more sophisticated, and how our kids are just you know glued into it right away. They're glued into it because they can't help it. They see mom talking on the cell phone. They see dad pull up a tablet Mm -hmm. and do this kind of thing, you know. So it's exciting. And so, Tosca, you know, the show is always about encouraging authors. And so on the couple Mm -hmm. minutes we have left, go ahead and encourage the authors whom God has given Mm -hmm. the gift to write to pick up that pen Mm -hmm. and write. Yeah. Well, you know, here's here's a a thought that I will leave them with. you are created in the image of the most creative being in the universe. So creativity is in your DNA. And to suppress that creativity is to suppress a part of who you really are. So out of the legacy of that ultimate creator and in honor of that ultimate creator, honor that part of who you are by picking up the pen and writing your story. God has a story to tell about you, but a part of that happening is you telling your own story. I like that. Especially you said you are <laughs> created in the image of the most creative creator in the universe. I yep. like that. I may have to put that in a, a frame and put it on some paper mm-hmm. and just put it on my walls because that'll preach. <laughs> if I had a podium, I would give you a podium and have to preach right now. <laughs> Can we get an amen? Do. Yeah, you know, and at my old church, they you throw the fans at the pastor and all that. So I'm going to oh. throw the fans. I love that. And I think that's going to help someone out there who wants to write to pick up the pen and write. Tosca, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with me on the show. Oh, thank you for taking time. Thank you, Parker, schedule. for having me again. This is always so much fun. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for your work. And thank you for your radio show and, and helping other authors also uh, meet, meet other readers. So thank you for that. We were just having a wonderful, fantastic time with my wonderful guest co-host and contributor today, Tosca Lee. Uh, I want to thank Tosca for her kind, kind words. You know, I enjoy having Tosca on the show. For those of you who follow me now for four years, when she first came onto my show, I was a nervous wreck. I could not hardly talk. I was so excited, and I was thinking, will she give me the time of day? And she gave me the time of day. And I remember thinking, but this is a New York Times bestselling author. Are they human? And you've come to find out she's just as human as me and you and anybody else. And so uh, to be here and have her with me again four years, four years down the line, it's absolutely wonderful. So if you want to get a copy of Tosca's book, you want to know what Tosca's all about. You want to follow her blog, talk to her. I want you to go to her website, ToscaLee.com. That's T-O-S-C-A-Lee.com. Find out any and everything about her. What you definitely want to do, for those of you who have been hanging out for progeny, Firstborn is out. Go ahead and get a copy of it today. You're going to be disappointed. Tosca is a phenomenal writer. My personal favorite is How Also Enjoy Demon. So if you want to go ahead and get a copy of Tosca's book, go to her website, Tosca Lee, or follow her on her Twitter. She has Twitter, Tosca Lee, very simple. And, you know, you want to bless her by buying her books because you're going to be blessed when you read them, too. Thank you for joining me for this edition of The Right Stuff. You have a wonderful, absolutely glorious day from the Queen of Tuesday Nights, Parker J. See you soon.
Thank you for joining us for this edition of The Right Stuff. Follow Parker online at parkerjcole.com. To hear this show and other shows, visit the show archive at therightstuffradio.wordpress.com. We'll be back same time next week, 7 p.m. Eastern Time.